Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. The medieval version of the millennial avocado craze, if avocados were only eaten when rotten and commonly referred to with a sexual nickname anyways, turns out that after we die, certain zombie cells go into overdrive. And the super popular Twitch stream of a stop sign. Just thousands of people watching a live feed of a stop sign that cars never seem to pay attention to. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. What if the only way that we ate apples was after they'd rotted to the core? What if everyone so accepted the phallic appearance of the banana that we commonly referred to it with a rude nickname? What if one day our avocado craze ends so completely that our grandchildren won't even know what an avocado is? These are all truths about a medieval fruit called the meddler. Or at least that's what we currently call it, quoting the BBC. For the best part of 900 years, the fruit was called the open arse, thought to be a reference to the appearance of its own large calyx or bottom. The meddler's aliases abroad were hardly more flattering. In France, it was variously known as la partie posterieure de ce quadruped, the posterior part of this quadruped, sous de singe, monkey's bottom, sous den, donkey's bottom, and col de chien, dog's bottom. You get the idea. End quote. And yeah, if you check out the photos at the link in the show notes, you will indeed get the idea. The color and texture of the fruit is a bit fleshy, I suppose, but it was called an open arse fruit less because of how rotund it was and more because of the calyx, the part where on an apple you would find a stem. It's pretty distinctly uh, sphincter-like in appearance. And if that is enough to turn you off of ever trying a meddler, just wait. You could only safely eat them after they've gone soft and rotten. Quoting again, When they're first picked, meddlers are greenish-brown and resemble oddly-shaped onions or alien-looking persimmons. If they're eaten straight away, they can make you violently ill. One 18th century doctor and botanist said that they cause diarrhea. But if you put them in a crate of sawdust or straw and forget about them for several weeks, they gradually darken and their hard, astringent flesh softens to the consistency of a baked apple. The exact chemical mechanism involved remains elusive, but broadly, enzymes in the fruit break down complex carbohydrates into simple sugars, such as fructose and glucose, and it becomes richer in malic acid, the main culprit behind the sour taste of other fruits, such as apples. Meanwhile, harsh tannins, which contribute to the bitter astringency of younger red wines and antioxidants such as ascorbic acid or vitamin C, are depleted. The process is known as bledding, a word made up by a botanist who noticed there wasn't one in 1839. The result is an ultra-sweet fruit with a complex flavor, like overripe dates mingled with lemons and a slightly grainy texture." End quote. Mmm, grainy and rotten, just how I like it. Unsurprisingly, even at the height of their popularity, opinions were divided about the fruit. They were popular because they were harvested in winter, making them one of the few fruits and sources of sugar people could get in the winter months. And they could be baked, jellied, added to pastries, turned to cider and brandy, so there were tons of uses for them. And they've been preserved in spirit because their unique rotting-before-eating nature, not to mention all the possible double entendres, made them perfect for metaphors, which means they pop up frequently in literature, from the Canterbury Tales to Romeo and Juliet. So it's possible they actually just seem a bit more common than they actually were because they're over-indexed in the literature of the time. And here's the line from Romeo and Juliet, just before the famous balcony scene in Act 2 when Mercutio and Benvolio are giving the out-of-sight Romeo a bit of grief. Mercutio says, quote, Now will he sit under a meddler tree and wish his mistress were that kind of fruit as maids call meddlers when they laugh alone? Oh, Romeo, that she were, oh, that she were an open arse, thou a popperin pear. The popperin pear was a certain species of pear that was a bit slimmer and taller than pears as we think of them, and, well, let's just say referencing a popperin pear was a bit like sending an eggplant emoji. 
So you can kind of get the gist of the shenanigans that Mercutio was suggesting Romeo wanted to get up to with Juliet here. But the origins of the meddler go back much further than Shakespeare or even Chaucer. Some believe they were first domesticated near the Caspian Sea about 3,000 years ago, but our first record of their existence comes from a line of 7th century Greek poetry. From there, scholars believe the Romans brought them to France and Britain, and from about 800 to 1000 CE, it steadily grew in popularity until it reached its peak in Elizabethan England. That is about the time I think we could really compare it culturally to the avocado now. Its popularity declined after that, but it was still around in the United Kingdom even into the 20th century. In fact, during World War II, it was included in a Victory Garden pamphlet produced by the British government, which encouraged people to forage for meddlers. But shortly after that, it just vanished, at least from Britain. You can't find it in stores there anymore, and many people have never even heard of it. So what happened? Well, it's likely to have been pushed out in favor of newer, less disgusting fruits that became more cheaply and widely available year-round throughout the 20th century. Fruits like bananas and pineapples that you could get even in the winter. You didn't have to leave a banana in a box covered in sawdust for several weeks before eating it, so it was much more convenient. But the meddler remains quite popular in its original home near the Caspian Sea, in Iran, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, and Turkey. And even in Britain, certain enthusiasts continue to cultivate the fruit as much as they can. So, I don't know, who knows? Maybe it'll make a comeback at some point once we all get sick of avocados. Regardless of your beliefs on the afterlife, as far as scientific fact goes, we know that when you die, the physical body shuts down. Once the heart stops beating, it's all over. Except... Maybe it's not. A new study published last week in the journal Scientific Reports suggests that glial cells, inflammatory cells that support other brain cells, especially after injury, actually increase their activity, expressing genes and growing long arms even after every other type of brain cell has stopped functioning. Quoting Sci-Fi Wire, These glial cells do not surrender to death, co-author Fabian Deshay told Sci-Fi Wire. Their normal function is to protect life and make a last-ditch effort to fix trauma and re-establish correct homeostasis of the brain environment. The genes they express post-mortem are the same genes we know to be activated after brain trauma or stroke and are involved in neuroinflammation. And continuing from Sci-Fi Wire, Zombie brain cells had not been observed before, since most studies of supposedly dead human brain tissue were carried out 12 or more hours post-mortem. Those previous studies had neglected to study brain tissue that had just been cut off from its oxygenated blood supply, which is also the time that glial cells start growing those creepy appendages that could really pass for grasping zombie arms. The tissue was studied at different points during a span of 24 hours to see what, if anything, survived. 80% of genes in the brain survived the entire period, end quote. And from Science Daily, quote, These included genes often referred to as housekeeping genes that provide basic cellular functions and are commonly used in research studies to show the quality of the tissue. Another group of genes known to be present in neurons and shown to be intricately involved in human brain activity, such as memory, thinking, and seizure activity, rapidly degraded in the hours after death. These genes are important to researchers studying disorders like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease, said co-author Dr. Jeffrey Loeb. A third group of genes, the zombie genes, increased their activity at the same time the neuronal genes were ramping down. The pattern of postmortem changes peaked at about 12 hours, end quote. And it's that research into treatment for conditions like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's that the researchers are particularly interested in, not so much in creating actual zombies or probing the mysteries of the afterlife. As Sci-Fi Wire explains, quote, Unlike the non-neuronal glial cells, neurons will die without oxygen. The human brain needs 10 times more energy than any other organ in the body. You can lose consciousness in seconds if blood supply stops flowing to your brain. When oxygen or energy plummets, it can lead to permanent damage and even cell death in the brain of a stroke or trauma survivor. Neuronal genes are activity-dependent, meaning that they can undergo drastic changes because of brain activity, such as epileptic seizures. Glial cells go full zombie because they are protective cells that try to compensate for any loss in brain function and protect the rest of the brain if one part loses oxygen and the rest is just barely grasping for it. 
In the segment of dead brain tissue that was studied, the glial response which produces genes was found to happen everywhere, which means that response would probably break out all over in the entire brain of a deceased person. Taking advantage of surgically removed brain tissue that is not needed for diagnosis or treatment can reflect what is really going on in a diseased brain before decomposition goes too far. End quote. And to assist researchers in figuring out how stable a specific gene is based on the postmortem interval, how quickly it degrades, or in what other ways it's affected, Dashe, Loeb, and their colleagues are working on a web interface that will be able to tell neuroscientists just that, hopefully leading to plenty of crucial insights on various neurological disorders, and maybe a few pretty cool sci-fi novels as well. There's a stop sign in Salem, Massachusetts, that almost every single car driving past just ignores. This isn't too spectacular. Maybe there's a stop sign like that in your neighborhood that you always have to watch for. But your neighborhood's stop sign probably doesn't have 200,000 people watching it live on Twitch. Stop Sign Cam has been running on Twitch for about a year, but a couple weeks ago it was shared on a popular subreddit and then by a major streamer whose TikTok about it went semi-viral, causing the Twitch channel to completely blow up. Going from just a couple of viewers to a concurrent 1,000 to 3,000 viewers at any time of day or night. There's a Discord, a subreddit, even a bot that keeps track of how many cars roll through the stop sign, come to a complete stop, or just zoom on through as if there's literally no sign at all. It's gotten so big that people found out where it was and started making pilgrimages there, doing eye-catching things so they'd get recognized on the stream, like dancing or having lightsaber battles. It all ended up getting a bit out of hand, especially when it escalated to Twitch viewers actually getting in touch with the channel owner's neighbors who live near the sign. Fortunately, people just sent them a bunch of pizza, nothing nefarious, but it was enough to make the neighbors uneasy. They reached out to the channel owner, and he decided he should shut it down. But it wasn't gone long. Stop Sign Cam is back and live on Twitch with a brand new intersection. Another stop sign that hardly any drivers seem to stop at. Kotaku quoted one fan from the Discord who said, As a fellow native of Massachusetts, it is completely expected that Cam was able to easily find another suitable intersection to showcase how terrible the drivers in this state are. End quote. In DMs to Kotaku, the Stop Sign Cam channel owner said that he's actually planning to take it on the road and switch up the location periodically to help protect everyone's privacy and keep things from getting out of hand again. So if you do have one of those stop signs that no one ever stops at in your neighborhood, maybe you'll see it on the Stop Sign Cam stream sometime soon. The allure of watching negligent drivers on this stream reminds me a bit of the classic 11-foot-8 bridge YouTube channel. If you're not familiar, the channel posts clips from a live feed of a railroad trestle over Gregson Street in Durham, North Carolina. Being several feet shorter than the standard overpass clearance of 14 to 16 feet, it tends to trip drivers up, despite all of the clearly labeled warning signs surrounding it. Because of its reputation for destroying trucks, locals call the bridge the can opener. And if you watch a few videos, you will absolutely see why. There's something truly cathartic, in a kind of schadenfreude sort of way, about watching truck after truck get destroyed by this bridge, seeing all of their different methods both for approaching it and hoping they'll make it, and for how they get out of it, or occasionally don't. And as perhaps some good news for Stop Sign Cam, the 11 foot 8 bridge channel has been regularly uploading videos for the past 12 years. And one of the best parts is that over those years, you can see the many attempts that the town has made to deter truck drivers. They added a bright orange bar, blinking traffic lights, an electric sign that warns when a truck is over height, and nothing seems to stop trucks from going through and utterly mutilating their vehicles. It has remained one of my favorite YouTube channels to watch for years, so check it out, as well as Stop Sign Cam, links to both in the show notes. And hey, you know, if you're a driver ignoring a stop sign or ignoring a bridge, just know that there could be thousands of people online making fun of you as you do it.
So you might have seen over the weekend that the U.S. Strategic Command, a.k.a. part of the Department of Defense responsible for our nuclear arsenal, tweeted out a bizarre string of letters and semicolons on Sunday, which went mildly viral before the account noticed and ultimately deleted the tweet. And it got people a bit concerned, mostly jokingly, you know, saying it could be the nuclear codes or a Russian hack, although sadly QAnon folks were genuinely concerned about its deeper meaning. Well, the Daily Dot filed a FOIA request to get to the bottom of it, and it turns out the confusing tweet was written by the Stratcom's Twitter manager's very young child. In one of the most relatable acts of the year, the manager left his computer unattended and his kid decided to send out their first tweet. True pandemic vibes. But that's it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.